Well, your grace. Hi. This is episode 100. Oh, <laughs> yeah. wow. 100 uh, episodes. Yeah. So yeah. Are, you, are you going to insert a drum roll or something? Yeah, pretty Matthew, much. Maybe there'll be confetti. Trumpets? Yeah, confetti just falling across something. the screen or something. See, see, what, see the effects that you come up with. Oh, that'd be yeah, great. This, oh, 100. So Bye. this is a challenge, an editing challenge for Matthew. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Hundred. Well, well. I know. Yeah, we started Gosh. in May, twenty twenty two, and we're oh, it's now been a couple of years. Yeah, it's been two years of podcasting <laughs> and one hundred episodes. Well, there we go. Yeah. All right. Good. How do you feel as a two year old podcaster? Uh, the emphasis is more like on the hundred. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. We've done a lot of talking. <laughs> yeah, a lot of talking. A well, please chatting. God, it's been a yeah. benefit to some. Yeah, you know, of course. But I sure enjoy. Getting together just to chat and talk and yeah. gives me a sense too of what's on people's minds and how we yeah. can accompany them in through all of that. So, so well, congratulations to you too and to Matthew. You're you're the what's the word the brainwaves behind this oh, well, initiative. The, yeah, de- definitely debatable. You know, you're a slightly important part of this whole equation. You know, no, no. Remember the, how it started? Is- no, no. You remember <laughs> Archbishop? You should have a podcast. I said, good. What's a podcast? <laughs> So, so how would you, you ex- so you what do you say it. now? What do you say now? And people say, oh, you have a podcast. What's that? It's that thing I do with uh, <laughs> Jenny and Matthew. We get together and talk. And after I talk and leave the studio, I have no idea where it goes, what happens. That's my understanding of It just goes of out into the ether. It's somewhere. A few people listen. Somewhere. People take me aside and say, hey, you're your podcast. So I'm glad they're, yeah. that is connecting somewhere along the lines. Yeah. Have, oh. yeah I know you, I mean, you're constantly visiting parishes and moving around Canada, moving around the archdiocese. Has there been anything that surprised you about um, being on the internet, sharing through a podcast in such a consistent way? Because you've done, for most of it's been every week for two years. Yeah, then we not too long ago went to the every two weeks. Um, well, one of the things that uh, has caught my attention a little bit is when I'm at national meetings and there's issues we're dealing with, we might want to think of a communications plan around whatever it might be. And a couple of times people have said, well, do you think you might talk about this on your podcast? And didn't even realize they were aware of the podcast. So I do, I do think people appreciate that w- whether it's this one or other podcasts, they do have a certain reach. They, they go towards a certain demographic. Podcasts don't reach everybody. Well, fine. Right. So what, whatever the, the modality is that's going to reach people, I think we need to be part of that. Probably helped a little bit. You would assess this better than I would, but probably helped a bit when we went to YouTube. I think that this is on YouTube, right? Yeah, YouTube. Um, that expands the reach too. So to, to hear that people outside the archdiocese are, for whatever reason, linking in and find it helpful and could see it as a tool to further the gospel in whatever context, I'm grateful to hear it. I'm grateful, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I was recently at a wedding and there was a bun- bunch of gentlemen there from Calgary huh? uh, with Bishop McGratton and... They were, they were teasing us about having a podcast and that we'd won well, we'd won up to Calgary. Oh, and we love Bishop to hear McGratton. that. I hope Bishop McGratton. <laughs> so this is a challenge we, to Bishop McGratton. We love Can you be up, a podcaster one up too? Calgary. Hooray, hooray. Very good. Yeah. Very good. So uh, I thought that since we're celebrating 100 episodes, that we could quickly, before we get into today's topic, review uh, three of our most listened to episodes. Oh, from okay. the past two years. Okay. And you might not even know these numbers, but so our definitely our most uh, listened to episode is episode 74. And that was an episode where we discussed the Catholic Church as the one true faith. Oh, right. Yeah. 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 So we were dis- yeah, discussing that theme of the virtue of religion. That was also something that okay. came up in that episode. And so... I thought to revisit that topic quickly and quickly ask you if someone was uncomfortable saying the Catholic church is the one true faith, what advice would you give them? Now, Matthew, I'm hoping that the answer that I give now is the same that I gave 25 episodes ago. So I didn't ask the exact same question. We'll do a flashback here. A flashback and and compare, Mm -hmm. compare. Everything goes back to Jesus. Everything. Everything in the Christian life, it, it stems from him and from his revelation, his revelation that he gave in words and in deeds, that they, they, they mutually interpenetrated. So we, we, we go back to Jesus for everything. And when it comes to the church and her nature and her mission, we can only understand it properly 
if we understand how it arises from the will of Jesus himself. And so without going into any details, I mean, the church in her self-understanding has always accepted that uh, her essence and her mission arises from the will of the Lord Jesus himself. And so that's what we mean by uh, the Catholic Church being the one true church. Everything that Jesus intended to be present in his church is present in the Catholic Church. Absent sin, obviously, in terms of her structure, her mission. Uh, he as head, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, um, the oversight of the apostles, the, the creed, the apostolic deposit, and so it's all there. It's all there. Uh, so it's it's that's basically it. You know, we we understand that it's rooted in the intention of the Lord Jesus Himself. It's not something that we made up. So it's not arrogant to say that as a Catholic, I'm part of the one true faith. No, I wouldn't call it arrogant at all. In fact, it it would call forth the uh, opposite sentiment, the sentiment of humility, because we all know that we're sinners. Right? We all know that we're in need of redemption. We all know that we're weak limited. And yet the Lord has chosen to fashion his church. The Lord has chosen to free us from sin through the, the graces that reach us in the sacraments to bring us into this wondrous body of redeemed sinners to continue to be he himself within the church is our life and endows us also with a mission and with a destiny. Uh, none of which is merited. Nothing of, of the Christian life is merited. It is all gift. Um, St. Paul, right, in his letters, he says, what do you have that you haven't received? So there's no room at all for boasting, arrogance, or anything like that. Um, it's just gift, and we rejoice in it humbly. Well, and if anyone wants to listen to that full episode, because you and I talked about this for about an hour mm -hmm. um, when we first released it, so that episode will be in the show notes. Another episode that had a lot of listeners stood out was the episode we did on what is appropriate to wear to mass. <laughs> I, <know. laughs> I, I, I wondered what sort of uptake there'd be on that one. I, like, I oh, know. Yeah. Boy, oh boy. Getting a little, getting a little spicy. About, no. Yeah. And it was, if I remember correctly, Matthew was reminding me that it was kind of a spontaneous episode. We didn't think much of it. You know, sometimes you can't always anticipate what will really resonate yeah. uh, with the listener base, but this one was very well listened to. Yeah, that's funny. So what advice would you give someone who wants to review how they are dressing for the Holy Mass? Just keep in mind, uh, and this is not getting into fashion specifics, that's not, <laughs> it's not my world. Yeah. Um, just keep in mind that we always dress to reflect the nature and the dignity of the occasion. That's what we do. And the Mass is not casual in its essence. The Mass is the people of God gathered for the mystery of the Eucharist to offer their, to encounter Jesus Christ in the Eucharist and through him to offer the entirety of their lives to the Father. It is the highlight of the week. It is the most important thing that we do. And that needs to be, it seems to me, reflected in our demeanor, in our posture, in our gestures, our attitudes, our preparation, and yes, in including in the way that we present ourselves for this, for this event. Um, obviously beyond that, you leave it to the, to the understanding of the individual, what it is to dress appropriately in a dignified fashion, um, uh, for the Eucharist. Now that's not to say that if you're rushing home after a, a shift at work and you don't have time to change or something and you, you know, you need to get to mass, well, you come as you are, of course. Um, but where there is time for preparation and thought, uh, just make sure that the, I think the way, the way that we present ourselves reflects the dignity of the occasion. Another theme that we talked about on that episode was, I might be pronouncing this right or not, Lex Arande, Lex Credende. Oh, that was one of our first ones. Yes, but in yeah. this particular episode, it came up when we were talking about what we, how we dress for Mass. Uh, oh, okay. Um, and my understanding of that phrase, that Latin phrase, is that it essentially translates to how we worship so we believe or how we worship affects how how we believe? Yeah, well, so we basically the idea is that uh, the way that we pray is reflective of what we believe, and what we believe gets reflected in our prayer. And how is it pronounced correctly? Lex, Lex orandi, Lex credendi. Right. Yeah. The I law mean, of praying is the law of believing. The law of praying is the law of believing. Yeah. Yeah, and talking about how if even perhaps 
well, proposing the idea that if someone is struggling with a sense of boredom in mass or even questioning the reality of what is going on in the liturgy, that dressing for the occasion may actually help align our minds with the truth of what is occurring in the sense that if we show up in sweats or if we show up just wearing something that's overly casual, then we're not definitely not assisting ourselves in right. strengthening right. what we believe. And, and, and just as an add, add on to that, and this is stating the obvious, but I hope we don't fall into the trap of judging one another on the basis of how they're dressed when they, <laughs> when they come to mass. Right. So. That would also be besides the yep. point of why we're yep, there. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that episode will also be in the show notes and our, our final episode that has um, garnered a, a lot of attention and excitement was the episode, let's see, episode 85. And we talked about Marian devotion. Oh. Yeah. Marian apparitions, the rosary, how to approach Marian devotion, um, how Mary reflects Jesus, you know, does Mary take away from Jesus? Oh, right, Those right, questions. Right, yeah. The question I have for you today is if there are, there are a lot of the Catholic faithful who uh, it, to different levels are excited and following different Marian apparitions, right? Mm -hmm. There's so many different uh, Marian apparitions, some that are verified, some that are not, et cetera. If someone is in a position where they're finding that there's tension in their life, they're having disagreements about the legitimacy of different Marian apparitions, uh, and it is causing a lack of peace or division in their life, how would you counsel them to take a first step in, in, in addressing that? Well, first of all, if it's causing a lack of peace in their life, let it go, right? It's not up to the individual believer to decide if a, if the, if a claim of an apparition is legitimate or not. That's, that's given to the local Episcopal authority who would discern that in communion with, um, with Rome and with the authorities there. So d don't get caught up in all of that and think and take to yourself a responsibility that's not yours. Um, and focus instead on what we know to be true. Mary is the mother of Jesus, therefore the mother of God. She's our mother, and she's queen of heaven and earth. And her prayers and her intercession have a power beyond all imagining. So just trust in that. Turn to, to Mary and pray as the church has traditionally prayed to her, especially through the rosary. And anything that's causing you angst along those other lines, just, just let it go and let the church discern and decide. In fact, <clears throat> and I, I must admit I haven't had a chance to look at them yet, but just recently the Tecastery for the Doctrine of the Faith, I think it was, came out with some guidelines to help uh, shape and direct that discernment around Marian apparitions. I haven't seen them, but the point is, um, it's 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 the church authorities that decide. So don't get caught up in that. Well, thank you. All and right. that's the, that's kind of a, a highlight of some of the episodes that okay, have been well attended three. to. But there are a hundred as of today when people are watching this episode. Okay. There's a hundred episodes to watch. Right there, you so go. <laughs> there's there's a lot of hours of you and I talking on the internet. <laughs> well, thank thank God we've come to this point. Yes, yeah. praise God. Yeah, yeah. praise be Jesus. So today we're talking about confirmation. You've been traveling oh. the sacrament of confirmation. You've been traveling across the archdiocese celebrating the sacrament mm -hmm. of confirmation mm -hmm. for literally hundreds and hundreds of, of youth and young adults yeah. and other individuals that are receiving that sacrament. I remember going to a catechism class and someone described to me that confirmation is like stirring up the fruits or the gifts of the spirit inside of you. They used this metaphor. They had a glass of milk. <laughs> okay. Bear with me. They had a glass of milk. Okay. And Could be some homily ideas here, yes, Matthew. There you, so I'm well, listening very intently. We're, we're going to test the legitimacy of this theology. Oh, right. That's why okay. I'm bringing it up. Okay. So a glass of milk, and then they put chocolate syrup, and the chocolate syrup goes to the bottom of the glass of milk. The, we are the glass of milk, and the Holy Spirit <laughs> is the chocolate syrup. And so I remember this being demonstrated to me. They stirred up the milk and all of the chocolate syrup makes it into chocolate milk. And this teacher said, that's what happens at confirmation. We already have the gifts of the spirit within us, but confirmation kind of shakes us up and makes them active when they weren't before. On a scale of one to 10, <laughs> how's the theology? <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, a little shaky, maybe. Okay, little, okay. Just, just kind of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we didn't name names, so, and this no, is no, many years good. ago. That's so that's good. Um, yeah. Listen, I think it's important to keep in mind. Um, so, so there's an insight there in what you said in terms of the relationship between the sacrament of confirmation and that of baptism. The Holy Spirit's active in all of the sacraments, including in baptism. And so, through the working of uh, the Holy Spirit at baptism, we're set free from original sin and from personal sin. We're we're given the life of Jesus Himself flowing within us. We become a member of his church and a disciple and a follower of the Lord. Um, and so there would be gifts that, that come with that, you know, with the Holy Spirit. Um, confirmation is it involves a distinct bestowal of the Holy Spirit over and above that which was given at baptism. And we ought not to be surprised by that because Jesus himself, even in his own life, had distinct and different bestowals of the Spirit, the bestowal of the Spirit, if you will, active at the incarnation, the bestowal of the Spirit, you know, at his baptism and so on. So to have distinct bestowals in the life of the believer is, is, is somehow reflective of how that works, how it worked in the life of Jesus. What is distinctive about the gift of the Spirit at confirmation is um, the bestowal and the strengthening for mission. All right. And again, distinct gifts come from that. We speak of the seven gifts of the of the Holy Spirit and those those gifts that will awaken certain fruits for sure. But what I like to focus upon for confirmation is the distinctiveness in terms of sending us out. So by baptism, we become followers of the Lord. We learn from him. We live from him. We live for him. Confirmation highlights what happened, highlights in the life of the believer what happened at Pentecost for the apostles, where they first received that Holy Spirit and they were sent forth. They were transformed and sent forth. And the, that's in the Acts of the Apostles. And the Acts of the Apostles also uh, makes a distinction between the baptism in the Lord and a, another bestowal of the Holy Spirit that comes from the laying on of hands by the apostles. And it's from that that the church has understood that the what we call the ordinary minister of the sacrament, of confirmation, is the one who succeeds to the role of the apostle, the bishop. So that's that's why the bishops all try to get around as much as they can in the diocese to confer confirmation. It's not always possible, and so that's the case here in the Archdiocese of Edmonton, to get to every confirmation. So the church also makes it possible for the bishop to delegate another to do it, usually the pastor of of the of the parish. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, but anyway, I think that's what we need to keep in mind is the the, f the fundamental of confirmation, this bestowal for mission, ascending forth, which is, which is a bit different from the theology of the glass of milk and, and kind of the, the stirring up of, of the gifts. Is there any theological accuracy to confirmation stirring, some, activating something in us that's already there? Or is it more so a bestowal, like something fresh and new is being given to you? It's probably a both end. It's probably a both end because we do come before the Lord in our weakness and aware that there are gifts that need to be uh, awakened within us. But there is a distinct bestowal of gifts that we say comes with the anointing of the Holy Spirit right? and the fruits that would flow from them also. So it really is, in a, in a, in a sense, confirmation is a, is a commi it's the commissioning sacrament. It's... It's go forth and and proclaim yeah. the gospel sacrament. And, and it's a permanent commissioning, right? So there are three sacraments of the seven that are never to be repeated because the Lord in those three sacraments brings about a fundamental change, a distinctive participation in the life of the body of the church, uh, which the Lord never calls back, if you will. Uh, baptism, confirmation, and holy orders. They are given but once and never to be repeated because there is this, this um, bestowal of, of, uh, of a distinctive place and role, all part of the building up of the church. Um, it, t traditionally, it has gone by the term sacramental character. It's one way of expressing that there's a, a permanent change, a permanent commissioning that is happening in these sacraments. The three sacraments by which the church constitutionally is actually built up, baptism, confirmation, and and holy orders. I've heard it said that you receive an indelible mark at confirmation. 
That's that's one way in which people people talk about it. It's um, I've always I've talked about it in the past. I've always been a little bit uncomfortable with it in the sense that you get the idea of maybe if you had a metaphysical microscope, you'd see this little mark on that the soul. That is, in fact, what I'm imagining. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So really, what what the the doctrine of the character wants to wants to communicate is what God is doing and what God is doing permanently. God. Um, so, so the idea of an indelible mark draws the focus on me, but what is the purpose? What is the purpose behind that? And so, if you look at the original Latin of the of the of the church documents that speak about this, it will speak about the giving of a character, unde, whence uh, the sacrament is never to be repeated. In other words, it takes the attention off the individual towards God. God is doing something. I like to root it biblically in the one of the great, great Christological prophecies. When um, you remember in um, is it Second Samuel, where King David wants to build a house for God, and at first the prophet Nathan comes along and says, "Go ahead," but then God, you know, speaks again through Nathan and says, "Wait a minute, what are you doing? You think you can build a house for me? I'm going to build a house." The house will be permanent, and I will build it on one who is of your uh, family, your descendants. A prophecy of Jesus, a prophecy of the church built on Jesus, a church that would be permanent, lasting, and the three constitutive sacraments by which the church is formulated are just those, baptism, confirmation, and holy order. So in virtue of what God is doing in permanent fashion, as he once promised through Nathan to David, uh, these are sacraments that are never to be repeated. That's the biblical background, and over time it has received this term, character. They also can't be repeated, right? They cannot. They cannot it, be so repeated. if someone were to not know that they're confirmed, and then they were to go through the ritual of confirmation right. again, it, it would just be null and void. Right. It wouldn't That's happen. Right. And okay. sometimes people will say, oh, gee, I'm, I'm just starting to come alive in my faith, do you think I can be baptized again? Well, no, no, you can't be baptized again. It's just just the ones because of God's permanent action in your life. Yeah. But if someone's in that position where they think, I'd like to be confirmed again. You know, when I was 13 and I got confirmed, I really just wasn't invested. I did it because the school told me right. I needed to. I wasn't really present. But now I'm, let's say, 25, I'm 40, and I care now. I want to be on fire with the Holy well, Spirit. What do I do with that? There's a distinction that the church has always made in terms of the bestowal of sacraments between valid and fruitful. All right, A sacrament properly celebrated is always valid in, if it's you know, according to the, the matter and form, in virtue of Christ's action in it. Right? So it's always valid. It takes effect. Um, the degree to which it really overcomes one in life and really becomes active, that, that, uh, that becomes a matter of one opening their heart to the gifts that have been given. That's when things start to become fruitful. So in the case that you just raised, what I would say to the person is, remember the formula by which you were confirmed. Be sealed with the gift of the Holy Spirit. So the Spirit's bestowal has been given to you permanently. It's valid. It is forever. Um, sounds like maybe you're at a point now where you really want, and this itself would be the prompting of grace. We understand this, but... This would be a moment in which you now can call upon the Holy Spirit and say, bring alive, bring alive the gifts that you've given me, bring alive the fruits of those gifts in my life and in the life of the church. In other words, call upon the Spirit to bring to fruition that which was uh, brought about validly at the time of the, of the sacrament. When I was growing up, there was this little catechism, very simplified catechism that my mom would read to us. And for each of the sacraments, there was a one to two sentence description. Oh. If someone were to ask you, what is the sacrament of confirmation? And you had about two sentences, how would you describe it? I'd say it's the sacrament of sending forth sacrament of mission okay. uh, and the empowerment for that mission. Mm -hmm. As the apostles were sent in the power of the spirit, when the Spirit came down upon the Church of Pentecost, and, the, and in her prayers during the ritual for confirmation, the Church will say it's the very same Spirit, obviously, that was given to the apostles that's now given to the recipients of confirmation. The Spirit given for mission, for boldness, courage to be out there. Right? Mm -hmm. Love that story in the Acts of the Apostles where the 
were the apostles, and I would have been right there with them, I'm sure. We're just so timid and afraid and not understanding. What's this all about? And the Holy Spirit came down and, oh boy, transformed. There was no holding them back. And people were watching and listening to these speeches that were coming out of St. Peter, for example. Wasn't this guy an uneducated fisherman at the sea? Where does he get all this, right? So the transformation that comes about from the Holy Spirit when the heart is fully, fully open to it, it's a, it's a wondrous, wondrous thing, but all for the sake of mission. You did your PhD in sacramental theology uh, yeah. on confirmation, right? Actually, more more specifically on the doctrine of the sacramental character. You know, how is it looked at in literature and so on. So okay. it touched on all those sacraments that confer it. Those three that you'd reference, yep. baptism, confirmation, yep. and holy orders. Yep. Okay. So this is something that you've certainly thought a lot thought about. Thought a little bit about, yeah, over yeah. time. Yeah, it's it's really, really a beautiful doctrine when you think about it, that we are being called into the mystery and the mission of the church mm -hmm. and given a permanent place and role within it. Mm -hmm. Scripturally based in the, also in um, St. Paul, I think it's in Romans. Yeah, Romans where the gifts of God are irrevocable. God's call, right? His, his, his vision for us, his design for us, doesn't change, right? It's irrevocable. So that also gets reflected in the doctrine of the character, whereby God irrevocably inserts us in wondrous ways in the, in the mission of the church. I notice when I'm speaking with you often that you will reference scripture verses. And there's obviously not a Bible in front of you. This is the, these are scripture verses that you carry within your head and your heart. Why is it important for followers of Jesus to know scripture off by heart, as opposed to always having to? Well, I wouldn't. I wouldn't say first of all that I know it off by heart for sure. But you I know it's always, Romans, right? Yeah, yeah, Etc. Right. Yeah, yeah. You know quite the, a bit. The scripture. key, <laughs> the key, the key, right, is just to be familiar with scripture. With its, with its essence, with its beauty, with its, with its necessity. Um, it's the word of God. Who was it? Was it Cardinal Collins, I think, used to refer to the scripture as the human being's user's manual. Is that the term, right? If you want to understand the mystery of human life, go to the scriptures, go to the word of God. And at the end of the day, the word of God became incarnate for us, Jesus. This is the wonder of it. God speaks. God's not aloof. God speaks. He wants to reveal himself to us. It's not a matter of just providing us with isolated doctrines and dogmatic formulations and these sorts of things. No, no, no. God in revelation through his word and the gift of his son is giving us himself to draw us into relationship now and into eternity. How do we grow in that relationship? How do we grow in our knowledge of love? Well, listen to what he's telling us. And that's in sacred scripture. So, uh, you've heard me say, and we've gone through a hundred episodes. I'll bet I've repeated this in most of them. But I always, I always keep asking that question: Who are you listening to? Who and why? And if you're listening to something that's taking you away from Jesus, taking you away from the church, taking you away from His Word, why would you do that? Stop, right, and listen to what matters. The, the sacred Scripture all flows from God's self-revelation. As I mentioned at the beginning of the episode, you've been traveling around to parishes all across the archdiocese. Mm -hmm. We're in, you could say, confirmation season, yeah. right? So weekend after weekend, you're at parishes confirming um, youth, young adults. And uh, I heard that at one of the parishes that you went to, there was an interesting episode with a fire alarm. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Care to share? <laughs> I, it was at, uh, yeah, it was at St. Thomas More Church. And, Edmonton. Yep. Yeah. And it was, I mean, the church was packed. There was 170 confirmation candidates that sort of were there with all their families. Church, big church packed, ready to go. 2.30, I think. 2.30 p.m.? Uh-huh. Well, not a.m. I'm no, not going to have a confirmation at 2.30 in the morning. Just got to get my facts straight well, here. Well, I think I'm dedicated, but perhaps not to that, that degree. Yeah. I was there. I can confirm it was not oh, at were you there? 30 a.m. No. Oh, okay, okay. okay. So you remember, too. So anyway, about two minutes prior to the start of Mass, the fire alarm goes off. What? <laughs> stay calm, everybody. Stay calm. Stay calm. The Spirit is falling, the fire of the Holy Spirit. Oh, what did I say? I said at the beginning of Mass, for, I've been a bishop 22 years, done a lot of confirmations. It's the first time the fire of the Holy Spirit was such that it set off an alarm. But anyway, <laughs> turns out, 
<laughs> Poor little child. Some child, young child, pulled the alarm, and I thought, oh, boy, I don't think I'd want to be that child right about now. What are mom and dad thinking? What are they doing? But we had, everything went on hold, right? We just had to stop. We made an announcement. So here's what happened. So calm. You don't have to leave the church. But you had to wait. We had to wait. Now, thanks be to God, the fire station was just at the other side of the parking lot. So it didn't take the... Uh, the fire officials too long to get there, but we would not. We were not able to go on our own into whatever the control box is oh, to turn so off the alarm. You had to wait for the fire oh, officials yeah. to come in and do it. So you had to wait like a 30, 30 minutes or longer. Not that long? No, they were close. They were really was, quick. I, I don't think we were too late getting started, but yes, that's that's something that we'll uh, we'll remember. Well, the, whole, the so Holy nobody's going to remember it more than the parents of that young <laughs> child. <I'm sure. laughs> And you were just at St. Joachim's, I believe, was it yesterday? Last night. And that yes. was delightful. I mean, they're all delightful. They're beautiful. But one of the things that we're witnessing in our Francophone parishes is the uh, growing presence of African immigrants coming from French-speaking countries. And uh, and they, they bring the vibrancy of their culture to the liturgy. And that was present last night, too, in a lot of the singing. And they were even doing a little bit, um, dancing as they do, you know, in their spots. Um it was delightful, beautiful, beautiful to be there. A joyful celebration. It was sure. indeed. It was indeed. There was about 40, 45, I think. They, they, the, our, our three Francophone communities come together for the, for the confirmation celebration. So it's a good number and a lot of joy. Yeah, and we're spotlighting um, all these parishes that are celebrating confirmation on our social media oh, on a weekly basis. Oh, so if people want to follow us yeah. on social media, Facebook, Instagram, they'll see photos of you and all of the... Uh, confirmants? Do you call them confirmants? Confirm it? Um, the confirmed. The so confirmants. So confirmed. the, the one needing to be confirmed. So that would that would be the one, the candidates. Right? Yes, the candidate who's being and confirmed. So, uh, confirmed? Confirmand, A-N-D. Mm, that's not my favorite word. No, okay. but then afterwards, <laughs> the ones who have been confirmed, right? The confirmed, yes. Not confirmed. Yeah, yeah. Well, we have confirmed the word for those who are being confirmed. Very good, Jenny. Very, Very good. I know. Yeah. It's so clever. It's so clever. <laughs> Well, we better wrap this up before the up. sense of humor okay. really dives Good. off a so cliff. so we can get on to 101. Yes. Right. I was going to say, though, to parents who are preparing their children for confirmation, because you still have many confirmations yep. ahead of you at the time of this yep. recording, what advice would you give to parents who want to prepare their children to receive the sacrament? Uh, yeah, okay. A couple of things. Um, first of all, Matthew, do we still have – you and I did a video. Yeah, Matthew oh, and I yes. did a video – Kind of showing what the bishop, archbishop, brings to confirmation, all the, the paraphernalia that he wears to oh, yeah, explain we'll put that. Yeah, we'll that in the show notes. Yeah. Yeah, so that that could be helpful. People understand what the symbols are before the the bishop arrives. But to parents directly, first thing I'd say is thanks. Right? Thank you first of all for having made the decision to have your child baptized. I thank God that mom and dad made that decision for me all the time. Nothing, there's nothing more important than that. But then. Uh, one, at the time of baptism, parents make a solemn commitment before God in the presence of the church to bring the child up in the practice of the faith. So thank you for that too. And um, that means not only making sure that your child celebrates the sacraments, but that you journey together with them in that, grow together with them in that, learn together with them. In it's, oh, these are wonderful opportunities for all of us to understand the faith better, to grow in our faith better, and beneath all of that, to grow in our relationship of love with the Lord. So pay close attention uh, to what your son or daughter is learning. Um, seek to study that with them to the degree that you can. Go to the classes with them to the degree that you can. And make this very much a family event. Families are there for the celebrations in wonderful ways. Gosh, all kinds of excitement and pride in the child and the f- photographs all over the place so they know it's a really really important thing but let your accompaniment of your son or daughter not be um isolated just in those moments of celebration but make sure you're accompanying them all the way through um your presence and your constant accompaniment is the greatest gift that you can give to your child Thank you, Your Grace. You're welcome. This has been really really informative and I, I always find these discussions to be particularly particularly enriching, even though, you know, well, we were both confirmed years ago and yeah, oh, it's ancient so much ancient. Gracious <laughs> sakes. 
Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it's so wonderful, like you were saying about parents journeying with their kids. It's so wonderful as even if it's been however many years since you've been confirmed, anyone who's listening, to be able to dive back into the theology of what we received, even if we've kind of forgotten what confirmation is. Great reminder yes. that we're confirmed. Yes. Right? That's where we're living it. Well, cheers. We have not yes. the most celebratory beverages. We have water. Cheers water. to yes, 100. Yes, everybody, it's water. Good. Yeah. All right. <laughs> cheers to 100 Congratulations. episodes. Congratulations. God yes. bless you. Yeah. Thanks. So thanks, everybody, for watching. Hope you found it helpful along your, your journey of faith. Please know that I'm praying for you. And if you would, be so kind as to pray for us also. Every blessing to you. God bless you.